and uh, I pray that the Lord may bless each one of us that he may give us a clear understanding of his word and uh, I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Malachi chapter 4 the same verse that has already been read we want to discuss um, one aspect of uh, the life and experience of John the Baptist you must have noticed that some <coughs> prophecies have a double application so this prophecy of Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6 about the coming of Elijah and the work of Elijah this prophecy had an application in the days of John the Baptist and this refers to John the Baptist but as I said some of the prophecies have a double application so this prophecy has a special application today and it refers to us it involves all of us we have been called to do this work which is uh, prophesied here in uh, Malachi 4 verses 5 and 6 you know there is a parallel between Elijah, the prophet Elijah and uh, John the Baptist and uh, the remnant people of God in these last days who have been called also to do a work in the spirit of, of Elijah <coughs> but we will not uh, discuss the work of Elijah or the work of John the Baptist or our work in general I want to present to you what is written in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy about the last chapter in the life and experience of Elijah and John the Baptist and also uh, in our own experience Matthew chapter 11 verse 7 and Jesus spoke to the multitude what went ye out into the wilderness to see a reed shaken with the wind references made to John the Baptist and Jesus wanted to uh, assure the people that John the Baptist was not a reed shaken with a wind oh no what is a reed shaken with a wind it's a person who uh, intends to the right one way and to the left the other way according to circumstances and conveniences but John the Baptist was not a man to be shaken or to be moved to be, to be influenced by uh, circumstances or conveniences he could not be compared to a reed he could be compared to a rock to a rock not to a reed now when Jesus spoke these words John the Baptist was in prison he was persecuted Elijah was also persecuted terribly persecuted and we will also be persecuted where does the Bible speak 
speak about the persecution that uh, the remnant people of God will suffer in these last days. Matthew 24 verse 9 after Jesus had spoken about the uh, different problems which would exist in these last days serious problems which would announce the, his soon coming and after he had said all these things are only the beginning of sorrows he said and they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake this means persecution is reserved for the remnant people of God in these last days uh, but let us understand this point not all Christians not all so called Christians or not all uh, professed Christians will be persecuted only a uh, certain class of Christians the true Christians will be persecuted and these are those that keep the commandments of God Yes, those Christians who keep the commandments of God in these last days, they will be persecuted. They have already been persecuted for some time in different places, but there will be a general persecution which is before us. Revelation twelve seventeen, And the dragon was wroth with a woman, that means with the church, and went to make war with with whom? with the remnant of her seed who are they? Uh, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ those who do not keep the commandments of God or all the commandments of God they will not be the object of persecution in these last days. Well, Satan has them in his pocket anyhow. But uh, those who keep all the commandments of God must await persecution. So we read that uh, the time is coming when we will have to leave the cities and the towns and then the towns and and uh, and seek refuge in the mountains and those who lag behind who are not in a hurry to do this they will be cast into prison yes they will be cast into prison now back to John the Baptist and John the Baptist was in prison. Why? When we hear about somebody who is in prison, we immediately have the idea, sometimes the wrong idea, that he has done, done something wrong, that he is a criminal. Why are people put in prison? Because they're criminals. But in those days, 2,000 years ago, people were put in prison for speaking the truth. People will also be put in prison in our days, in these last days, for speaking the truth. And uh, the great criminals were not put in prison. I repeat, the, the great criminals were not put in prison. Only the little thieves were. But the great criminals, were, they, went, they were loose at liberty. And even today, in many nations, in many nations, corrupt nations, the great criminals are not in prison. Only the little guys are. 
human justice is just like that. Well, John the Baptist was in prison because of the message that he presented. Uh, he attacked especially the, uh, the sins of the people, and he did not spare anyone, no exception, and he also spoke against the wrong step that Herod had taken. Herod had taken a very wrong step. He knew that. He had eloped with uh, the wife of his brother, with his sister-in-law. Actually, with the wife of his half-brother, Herodias. And she hated John the Baptist very much. And uh, she was not satisfied that he was in prison. She wanted something else. She wanted to see him beheaded. But John the Baptist was, was not concerned at first, at the beginning of his life in prison, because he put his confidence in a prophecy. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind the uh, brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So John the Baptist was well acquainted with this prophecy and he knew that this prophecy referred to Christ and he knew that Jesus Christ was a promised Messiah who was to fulfill this prophecy and he thought well I'm in prison but I have nothing to worry about because Jesus Christ my cousin they were cousins Jesus Christ, my cousin, will come here one of these days and he will set me free. But did John the Baptist interpret this prophecy correctly? He was a prophet. Do prophets always interpret prophecies correctly? Do they know everything or do they know only that which the Lord has revealed to them? And that which the Lord has not revealed to them? What happens? Hmm? They may often make mistakes in the interpretation and the understanding of that which the Lord has not revealed to them. And the Lord did not reveal to John the, Bap the Baptist the correct interpretation of this prophecy. He only used his personal conclusions he read his personal conclusions into this prophecy and his personal conclusions were wrong every prophet is subject to that and I think that every pro prophet mentioned in the Bible made similar mistakes we have no time now to go into details, but prophets in the Bible made similar mistakes. When they tried to um, understand and explain that which the Lord had not revealed to them, when they, when they had to use their own conclusions. For example, even Elijah, even Elijah, when he said, when he complained to the Lord, Lord, they have killed all thy prophets, and I'm the only one 
that has been left in this country to testify for the did he uh, repeat something that the Lord had revealed to him or did he use his own understanding his own conclusion and then he poured out his complaint again before the Lord Lord they have killed all thy prophets I'm the only one that has been left in this country and before long they will they will kill me also and uh, you will be left without any representatives in this country was that a revelation that the Lord had given him or was that his own conclusion that was his own conclusion and then the Lord said to him no I've never revealed this thing to you if you want to know the truth I have I still have 7,000 in this country who have not bowed the knee unto Baal but the Lord did not send him a list of names and addresses to go to these people no he had to to, to knock on many doors in order to find them this also happens today the Lord has his 7,000 symbolic number today who have not bowed the knee unto Baal but we don't have a, a list of names and addresses otherwise we would go direct to these people but this is not uh, the plan of God the plan of God is that we should knock on on the doors of the people in general in order to find these 7,000 but these 7,000 will be brought together yeah not 7,000 literally this is not a literal number today oh the number today is 144,000 uh, and God knows them and he knows where they are he knows their names and so forth we don't we're not supposed to know exactly who they are their names and addresses and so forth but we are to knock on every door in order to find them well back to John the Baptist as I said John the Baptist was not afraid because he thought Jesus would come and set him free and days passed by and weeks passed by and, and Jesus didn't come and then something happened to him the worst thing that can happen to a Christian happened to him and what's that? what's the worst thing that can happen to a Christian? the worst experience that a Christian can have in his life what's that? he began to doubt but was, what was the the reason for his doubts God was not responsible for his doubts the reason for his doubts was that he put his own understanding of a Bible prophecy and many times we also make the same mistake we put our own understanding on, on some of the Bible prophecies many times and he began to doubt and worse than that his disciples came to him in order to help him with their suggestions and instead of helping them they made it worse for him how? they increased his doubts <coughs> they asked him master master John don't you think that if this man called Jesus Christ were the promised Messiah don't you think that he would come here and set you free and he, he knows that you are in prison and he doesn't come maybe he isn't the, the promised messiah 
they only tried to help him with suggestions. In reality, they complicated matters for him, made it harder for him. Sometimes our best friends can be our worst enemies without knowing what they are doing or what they are saying. How and why. I'll ask you a question and you will give me the answer. Did John the Baptist discuss his doubts with his disciples? Did he? Did he reveal to them that he had doubts? No. That would be very dangerous. He was wiser than that. He did not discuss his doubts with his disciples. If a man has doubts, should he discuss his doubts with his brethren or with his children or with his wife? No. No. Never. Why not? Why not? If I discuss my doubts with my brother, <coughs> tomorrow, tomorrow I may, I may get rid of my doubts. Does that mean that my brother will also get rid of the doubts that I put into his mind? So, then why is it that John the Baptist did not discuss his doubts with his disciples? Why? Because he didn't want to contaminate them. If a man has doubts, who should he discuss his doubts with? Before whom should he pour out his, his doubts? Before whom? Alone before God in prayer and never reveal his doubts to either brother or friend or son or, or or wife or whoever never I repeat because if I have doubts I may get rid of my doubts tomorrow but this does not mean that those that I have affected contaminated with my doubts that they will also get rid of the doubts that I have put into their minds I may still be saved as a, as a a coal rescued from the fire but uh, those that I have contaminated with my doubts they are lost through my unwise words and actions so this is why John the Baptist did not discuss his doubts with his disciples now remember this uh, this detail it's very important for each one of us but while John the Baptist had his doubts um, on the one hand on the other hand didn't he have evidence plenty of evidence on which to establish his faith yes he, his uh, his uh, Position did not depend on uh, one prophecy only. His position depended on many prophecies. And his position depended on also on what he had seen and, and witnessed and heard. Let me read to you a statement from Desire of Ages, 
through 16. The Baptist, John the Baptist, did not surrender his faith in Christ. He did not give up his faith in Christ. Oh no. The memory of the voice from heaven and the descending dove and the spotless purity of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit that had rested upon John as he came into the Savior's presence. He could not forget that. And what's that? What would you call that in one word? In one word. In one word. And and this one word also applies to our experience in our days. This one word is called experience. John the Baptist had his experience. He had heard the voice from heaven saying about Christ, right after Christ's baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he had seen the dove alighting upon Christ. And he had um, witnessed, I mean he had seen the spotless purity of Jesus. And he had felt the power of the Holy Spirit resting upon him, John, upon him, upon John when in the presence of Christ. And that was something which he, John, could not forget. How can we forget our own experience with the Lord? And I'm sure of one thing. We, each one of us, has had his own experience with the Lord. An unforgettable experience. I have had mine, my experience And each one of you has had his experience with the Lord. And our experience with the Lord is not to be forgotten. Oh no. Oh no. But not only that. His uh, faith was based on something else also. The testimony of the prophetic scriptures all witness that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised Messiah. He was acquainted with the prophetic scriptures. He could not understand one, but he could understand the other prophecies. How about the prophecy of the 70 weeks, for example, and many other prophecies. Now, we have the same the same two evidences today on which to establish our faith. Second Peter verse 16 and on. We have not followed cunningly devised fables. Chapter 2 to chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, uh, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What would you call that in one word? Uh, for we he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from uh, the excellent glory saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased what is that in one word Faith. yes but that is experience they could not forget that which they had witnessed that is experience and we all have our experience with the Lord but uh, there's more than that verse 19 and we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn 
and the day star arises in your heart, in your hearts. What do we have besides our experience? We have the sure word of prophecy. And uh, if there is a people in the world who know something about prophecy, who, who, who are these people that study prophecy? We, some of the Adventists, we study prophecy more than any other denomination in this world. We study prophecy. And we know a lot about fulfilled prophecy. Or prophecy fulfilled. So we have, as John the Baptist, we have two main um, stepping stones. Two main stepping stones. To start with, two main stepping stones to cross the swamp. And we, if we step firmly on these two stepping stones, we will find a few more. We will find the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one until we reach the other side of the swamp. Now what are these two stepping stones? First, our personal experience with the Lord which is unforgettable each one has his own experience with the Lord the second stepping stone the knowledge of prophecy prophecy fulfilled and it's important to consider the sequence of prophecies fulfilled they are being fulfilled in the, in the right order in the right sequence in which they, they were given in which the fulfillment is to be expected. When I was a boy, I heard a man telling his experience. A man who uh, did not have any money in his pocket to buy a ticket from Curitiba to Sao Paulo, Brazil, about 400 kilometers, uh, less than 300 miles. But uh, he had to walk all the way from Curitiba to Sao Paulo. And on and he had to cross over a bridge. But the bridge was not made for, had not been made for pedestrians or for cars or for cattle, no. That bridge had been built only for the railway, for the train, for the train only. It was a railway bridge. And the rails were placed upon uh, ties or sleepers in British English. The rails were placed upon ties. And how was he going to cross over that bridge? He could uh, walk uh, on the trails or he could walk on the, by stepping on the, on the ties. This is what he did. He crossed the river by stepping on the ties. But if he wanted to step into the uh, open space between the ties, he could do that, couldn't he? Why not? He had his choice. So, we also have our choice. I'm, I'm trying to make a comparison. We also have our choice. We can explore the evidence. Let me use the plural, the evidences that God has given us. Or we can explore the doubts that the devil suggests to us. Yes. 
And what happens when we explore the evidences? What, what happens? The evidences become more and more evident to us. And if we begin exploring the doubts, what happens? They become stronger and stronger to us. So then we have two possibilities. We can either either step only on the on the ties until we reach the other end. I compare them to the evidences. Or we can explore the doubts. I compare them to the open spaces between the ties and get drowned. The choice is ours. Or, for example, we want to cross a swamp and there are the stepping stones across the swamp. And the first two stepping stones, what, would, what should we call them? What, what could we call them? Or what should we call them? The two first stepping stones. I mean the first two stepping stones. Mm -hmm. Experience, our personal experience with the Lord, and prophecy. And if we step on these two, if we step firmly on these two, what, what will happen? We see a third one, and a fourth one, and a fifth one, until we reach the other end. But if we want to step into the open space in between the stepping stones, if we want to step into the swamp, we can. The choice is ours. But the result is not the same. See, the result is not the same. So, we have a choice before us today. We can even, we can either stand on the evidence and explore the evidence that the Lord has given us, or What's the other possibility? Step into the open space. Step into the mire of doubts and get bogged down and drowned according to our own choice. Now back to John the Baptist. <laughs> And John the Baptist said to the, his two disciples, his, uh, uh, said to his disciples, Well, if you want to know, if you want to know, then you go to him and ask to Jesus and ask him. You go to him and ask him. But he did not discuss his doubts with his, his own doubts with his disciples. And I take it for granted that his own disciples never suspected that John the Baptist, their master, had his, his own doubts. I, that's my opinion. But uh, John the Baptist said to two of his disciples, Go and sh you go to John. Do you go to Christ? You go to Christ, and uh, and put to him the question. Verse three, Matthew eleven. Art thou he that should come, or do we look? Should we look for someone else? And they came to Jesus with this question. And Jesus knew all about the problem. Because Jesus could read hearts and minds from a distance. And what did Jesus say to the two disciples that, that were sent to him? And why, only, why two? 
Why didn't Jesus say, send only one? <laughs> Wouldn't it be cheaper to send only one? But he sent two. Another lesson for us. Well, what did Jesus say to the two disciples when they came to him with this question? A very serious question. Mm -hmm. Did he say to them, well, go back to John immediately and tell him, yes, I'm the one. You don't have to wait for another one. I'm the one. Would that have cleared the doubts of John the Baptist or of the disciples? No. What did Jesus say to them? He said to them, you sit down here and watch. A whole day. And what did they see? And as they stood wondering at his silence, the sick and afflicted were coming to him to be healed. The blind were groping their way through the crowd, diseased ones of all classes, some urging their own way, some borne by their friends, were eagerly pressed into the presence of Jesus the voice of the mighty healer penetrated the deaf ear a word a touch of his hand and the blind uh, uh, opened the blind eyes to behold the light of day the scenes of nature the faces of friends and the face of the deliverer and Jesus rebuked disease and banished fever. His voice reached the ears of the dying. And they arose in health and vigor. Paralyzed demoniacs obeyed his word. Their madness left them. And they worshipped him while he healed their diseases. And he... He even raised the dead in some cases. Don't forget uh, Lazarus and others. He taught the people, uh, the poor peasants and the laborers who were shunned by the rabbis as unclean, gathered closer about him, and he spoke to them the words of life. Now, at the end of the day, And Jesus asked them, those two disciples, Now, what have you seen? Oh, we have seen so many wonders, so many miracles. Okay. So you have seen all these things. Now you go back to John and tell him what you have seen. Just that. Just tell him what you have seen. And that will be enough for him to convince him. And they went and did as, Je as Jesus had told them. And John the Baptist was convinced. He had no more doubts. No more doubts. All his doubts had been cleared away. And then when the two disciples were gone Jesus addressed the multitude and asked them now what is your opinion about John the Baptist would you compare him to a reed shaken with the wind or would you compare him with a rock that cannot be shaken with the wind brethren we are stand before the same problem as John the Baptist did and Jesus wants to say, see in each one of them in each one of us Jesus wants to see in each one of us a rock a solid rock not a reed shaken up by the wind now why was um, this recorded in the Bible this 
last chapter in the life and experience of John the Baptist recorded in the Bible better in other words why did God allow John the Baptist to have this final experience John the Baptist was beheaded why didn't Christ uh, put, set him free he, he could have set him free if he wanted to but he did not why did Jesus allow that to happen to John the Baptist John the Baptist was not afraid to die after he had obtained the assurance that he needed John the Baptist was not afraid to die now why was this uh, why did this happen to him why did God allow this to happen to him and why was this recorded in the Bible for a specific purpose and this specific purpose is very important for each one of us Jesus knew that John would bear the test he was prepared to bear the test he was not afraid to die gladly would the Savior have come to John to brighten the dungeon gloom with his own presence but he was not to place himself in the hands of of, uh, enemies and imperil his own mission gladly would he have delivered his faithful servant but for the sake of thousands I repeat for the sake of thousands who in after years must pass from prison to death John was to drink the cup of martyrdom as the followers of Jesus should languish in lonely cells or perish by the sword or the rack or the faggot apparently forsaken by God and man what a stay what a support to their hearts would be found would they find in the experience of John the Baptist may the Lord help us and bless us with this experience of John the